So welcome everybody. I'm David Kennedy. I'm the founder of the well, the conference of the Bill Lane Center for the American West, which is the co-sponsor of this series of lectures about Western history, co-sponsor with, the, of course, the, the history department here at Stanford. And I want to thank Pedro and Catherine for folding up the history end of this, in this particular event. Uh, and the, the series is designed to make this community broadly aware of the really rich, dy dynamic character of the field of Western history as we get into the end of the first quarter of the 21st century. And I am pretty sure you're not going to be disappointed in that dimension this afternoon, but we're welcoming back to Stanford, Margaret O'Mara. Uh, Margaret, I think you began your teaching career here at Stanford. I did. About 20 years ago. 21. Yeah. <laughs> Fall and of 2002. Margaret was also affiliated at that time with the then brand new Lane Center. She was for a while the associate director of the center. And she's gone on now to be the Bullets Chair at the University of Washington in Seattle. She's the author of several books, uh, Cities of Knowledge, that was the first one in 2004. Four. More recently, The Code, about Silicon Valley as well, published in 2019. And even more recently, so recently that it's not yet official, but will be, <laughs> as of the publication date in 2024, Margaret is now the co-author, along with yours truly, of the, what will be the 18th edition of the American Pageant, which is a college-level textbook in our uh, history. So we're very happy to have uh, Margaret back with us. She's gone through the usual academic hoops as an undergraduate at Northwestern, PhD from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and today she's going to talk about billionaires of the American West from the big four to big tech. So, Margaret, welcome back to Stanford. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Thank you to everyone at the Bill Lane Center for putting this together. I know it's no small feat. Thank you to the History Department, my a familiar place. I did indeed start my college teaching career officially as being more than a TA, being an instructor of record here in this very building in the fall of 2002, or maybe it was winter quarter. Maybe they gave me a, a quarter to warm up before they unleashed me on the Stanford undergraduates, now all of whom are pushing 40, <laughs> the original, which really makes you feel old. Um, and, uh, and, and thank you to the, the, the Bill. It's really exciting to be back here um, at the Bill Lane Center. It's already left my its mark on the talk I'm giving today. Uh, big and the larger project of which it's a part. First of all, I was originally scheduled to come here in May and I had a, this talk all ready to go and then I got COVID and I had to cancel um, very, very sadly and unfortunately. And all of you were kind enough to invite me back. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm really happy to be here. And it was really interesting revisiting a presentation that I had written and then going back and, and getting to edit myself and, and, and add some new things. Um, but the center also left its mark because I had the great fun of joining the sophomore college on the West that the two Davids, Freiburg and Kennedy, led last month um, in Oregon. And that was really terrific. Uh, really helped um, crystallize some of my thinking around that part of the world. So, um, and this of course doesn't even begin to touch the much deeper connection to the Lane Center, which I arrived here um, as its first postdoc um, and uh, really under, learned Western history from the best, from Kennedy and from, from Richard White, um, and uh, really shaped my thinking about Silicon Valley as a Western place and how the history of this region and the history of this university intersects with the history of technology. Um, so thank you for all that. So I want to start with a, a couple of not very historical stories. So a little before six in the morning, on July 20th, 2021, Amazon founder and CEO Jeff Bezos strode across the tarmac of an airfield near Van Horn in West Texas to board a rocket that would send him and three others on a 10-minute ride into space. Bezos was also founder and CEO of Blue Origin, the maker of said rocket, and had been pouring about a billion dollars a year into the company. He could afford to. In the summer of 2021, Amazon had a market capitalization of close to $2 trillion. Jeff Bezos was the richest person in the world with a net worth of $214 billion, nearly 10 times the peak net worth of John D. Rockefeller adjusted for inflation. 
Bezos had once dreamed of becoming a NASA astronaut. Now his wealth was making that dream come true. And perhaps because this was such a long brewing desire, there were a lot of historical callbacks in the flight. The rocket itself was called the New Shepard after Alan Shepard, the first man into American into space in 1961. And one of Bezos' fellow passengers was Wally Funk, an American aviatrix who had volunteered for NASA's Women in Space program the year of Shepard's first flight. And the Mercury program ended before she could join one of its crews. When she flew with Bezos, the 82-year-old broke the record for the oldest person to go into space. But perhaps the most potent bit and most commented upon bit of symbolism was what the billionaire wore, pairing his flight suit with a well-worn cowboy hat and boots. Here was a man who was wealthy enough to build his and ride his own spaceship, leaning hard into Western myth. What one commentator on Twitter, of course, called Bezos' cosmic yeehaw moment didn't land quite as the mogul might have hoped. Comparisons were drawn not to John Wayne, but to Slim Pickens' character in Dr. Strangelove, whooping and hollering as he rode the nuclear missile into oblivion. Let's fast forward a little more than two years to just last week, in fact, and to Mark Andreessen, co-founder of Netscape, and of the venture firm Andreessen Horowitz, a person very familiar to this place and campus. Maybe he's nearby <laughs> listening. Maybe he's on Zoom. <laughs> Hardly as rich as Bezos, but a billionaire nonetheless. So a week ago today, Andreessen published a 5,000 word essay online titled The Techno-Optimist Manifesto. It has attracted a great deal of attention, both positive and negative, for its full-throated defense of technology, unfettered markets, and forthright condemnation of those who might stand in the way of tech-driven growth. Its framing of technological possibility also, a little bit like Bezos's cosmic cowboy ensemble, is something of a throwback to a particular way of thinking about the West, engaging a frontier mythos that Western historians moved away from long ago. And this is a, a screenshot, which I know the type is far too, far too small for you all in the room to see, but maybe you on Zoom will see. But what he writes here is, we believe that while the physical frontier, at least here on Earth, is closed, the technological frontier is wide open. We believe in exploring and claiming the technological frontier. We believe in the romance of the technology of industry, the eros of the train, the car, the electric light, the skyscraper, and the microchip, the neural network, the rocket, the split atom. We believe in adventure, undertaking the hero's journey rebelling against the status quo, mapping uncharted territory, conquering dragons, and bringing home the spoils for our community. Now, if you think I'm reading a little too much into Andreessen's words, consider that among the long and very intriguing list of, quote, patron saints of techno-optimism that he recommends his readers follow up and read, um, is, includes none other than Frederick Jackson Turner. So I come here today neither to praise nor to bury Bezos and Andreessen, but to open with these stories to underscore how much the current billionaire moment is a Western moment, one shaped and made possible by the Western past, conditioned by the Western present, and in which Westerners, especially the very wealthy ones, have gained outsized global influence on markets, politics, and culture. So let's do some numbers. There are 2,640 billionaires in the world as of 2023. This is a number, I believe, of extremely wealthy people greater than at any time since the Industrial Revolution, even with all inflationary adjustments and caveats. Of these billionaires, 735 are American. The combined net worth of these American billionaires is about $4.5 trillion, a number exceeding the nominal GDP of Japan, just for comparison purposes. The richest of the American rich made their fortunes in one part of the country, the American West. And these riches come mostly from one industry, high technology. So just this is a screenshot from 
Forbes that I captured over the weekend to get the latest data. These numbers change <laughs> with the markets, so, so this is probably different than it was two days ago. Um, of the wealthiest Americans right now, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Larry Ellison, Warren Buffett, uh, who lives, what would we say, like 200 miles east of the 100th Meridian in Omaha, is that safe? Um, Larry Page, Bill Gates, Sergey Brin, Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Ballmer, and Michael Bloomberg just representing New York just to, just to get it on the top 10 list. Um, so it's a very geographically concentrated and particularly Western list. And it is a very tech heavy list. Now, this enormity is re relatively recent. Um, and although the technology hub of Silicon Valley has been more than seven decades in the making, recent decades have seen a really sharp escalation in wealth that have um, given a great deal of attention to this new phenomenon. Now, there has been quite a bit that has been written about this billionaire moment. Uh, a boomlet that, funnily enough, starts off with a work by an economist in French, <laughs> but uh, is, uh, this was uh, you know, an unlikely bestseller that captured this um, curiosity and interest in the extraordinary wealth and wealth inequality of the modern era and looking at it over time. There have been a whole bunch of other books, biographies, studies of extreme wealth that have come out. Um, too many for me to list, it would be a very crowded slide, but you get the idea. There is a real interest in the, great, the greatly wealthy, including the fictional greatly wealthy. Um, I don't know how many people in the room or in Zoom were also obsessed with succession, but yes, I was too, and I miss it greatly. Um, so this, but there is a, you know, this dis discussions of wealth certainly focus on the technological wealthy, um, but not every one of these super wealthy are from tech, but there is something that is a strong correlation between this particular industry that is very geographically concentrated in the West and this growth of great wealth. Now, interestingly, there's, or perhaps not so interestingly, there are not a lot of historians on this crowded bookshelf, um, in part because the state of the field has moved away, well, although the, the early 20th century saw many a study of robber barons and uh, renegade capitalists and focused on, focus on ultra wealthy individuals. Really the history of political economy and more recently what's understood to be the history of capitalism has rightly looked at systems and institutions rather than individuals and focusing on individuals. So no surprise there. The other thing too is, is this chart shows when it comes to tech's uber wealthy, it is all a little too new for the dust to have settled for historians to properly assess the meaning and also quite difficult to write biographies of living people, as Walter Isaacson is <laughs> discovering in trying to play it straight down the middle with his biography of Elon Musk that is indeed a bestseller but has come under criticism for not having a take. And um, historians don't really like having takes. We like doing history. Uh, but even though historians are not entering the fray as much, the comparisons are being made for them. And even though the Western nature of this is perhaps the illusions extend to, you know, we see this, these, you know, slightly comic, ominous illustrations that are comparing the curse of California, kind of the iconic um, illustration of the railroad monopoly of the great West, of the far West of the 19th century, and comparing it with big tech of today. Um, there is, the comparisons can easily devolve into superficiality. There isn't really a lot of, um, comparisons only go so far. Um, not everything, this is not just history repeating itself. There are some rhyming elements indeed, but not everything is exactly the same. I would have found in trying to understand and bring more nuance and historicize this moment and thinking about how the past of Great, the past American great wealth and present compare with one another, particularly in the West, I've actually found that Western history has been the go-to place to go, in part because extraordinarily wealthy individuals have played such an outside ro role in the development of the American West since the 19th century, and also because of the way in which Western historians like Richard White, like David Igler, like Leslie Berlin have 
focused on individuals as part of broader capitalist systems and looked at the role of government, have looked at the way that individual business leaders are operating in concert with and in inter interacting with other, other parts of society, politics, and culture. Moving beyond the great man uh, theories and looking more at, at all of its complexity at these individuals in historical context. So I would, what I'd like to do today is to consider three questions that are drawing on that historiography, that are drawing on my own work on Silicon Valley in particular, and also this very new project that I'm working on, on American billionaires past and present. And considering, one, why has the West produced such extreme wealth, the American West? Why has it been the home of such wealthy people? How are today's Western tech billionaires like or different from their predecessors? And third, how is extreme wealth shaping the West today? So when going to this first question, I'm gonna to go to the definition that the Bill Lane Center provides of some of the salient characteristics of the, of the West. Um, one, its vastness, its aridity, its actual, it's the ecology of the West that distinguishes west of the 100th meridian from the rest of the continent. The presence of the federal government, the rapid growth of markets, of population, the ethnic diversity of the West, the role of populism and direct democracy in its politics, and also the mythos of the frontier, if we wanna capture that. So how, has that, how does that translate into answering this question of why have so many very wealthy people, men, come out of this place? And how does it explain these broader historical continuities? How can we historicize what's going on now? Let's start with someone who wasn't a Westerner, but was an Easterner, but was, again, I spend a lot of time doing inflation-adjusted net wealth um, uh, estimation. John Jacob Astor, who I would argue is, if you do all that estimate, that, that adjustment was America's first billionaire, who was, yes, based in New York City and was made just as much, if not more money in Manhattan real estate or owning the island of Manhattan than he did in the fur trade, but is very much a Western capitalist. And what, here we see, you know, at the beginning of the, of the 19th century, the very beginning of American, the United States trying to claim the Far West or portions of the Far West for itself. How private sector entrepreneurs like Astor, who first does this in what was then the, the West, the upper Midwest of the United States, and then later in the Pacific Northwest, tried to establish a toehold not only for his own empire fur trading, but also for to establish an American presence, to establish American sovereignty over Western territory through capital. Astor, when he set, uh, financed an expedition that went around the Horn to the Pacific Northwest, a very grueling voyage that was um, uh, full of infighting, inadequately provisioned, and ultimately was not very successful, he would, did not have need much money at that point. He had already made a fortune. He had loftier goals in mind, according to his great-grandson, William Waldorf Astor, who, writing about a century later, asserted in a very um, glowing bio biographical portrait of his great-grandfather, that John Jacob desired the creation of a vast emporium of commerce whose operations would explore and civilize the entire western coast of the continent, bringing its expanse within the influence and control of the American government. Still, he tried to do empire building on a budget. Astor's agent, Alexander Ross, a member of the Starcrossed expedition on, sent by Astor around um, to the mouth of the Columbia River, cursed his boss later for failing to supply a doctor to the ship's crew, saying, quote, nothing could more clearly prove his reckless indifference for the lives of people, unquote. This was a capitalist with an eye, with an eye to the bottom line and not big on investing in, his, in, um, in human relations. Uh, and that lean startup mentality, combined with the lack of further monetary or military support from the US government, which at the time was quite busy fighting the War of 1812, meant that Astor was ultimately unsuccessful in claiming the Northwest fur trade for the Americans, uh, at least in the near term. Later capitalists had more subsidy 
and more success. And this too is where the federal presence, the outsized federal presence in the American West plays a role in this creation of mass capital. By the middle of the 19th century, European American settlers of the far West were able to leverage public land, resources, federal subsidy to create considerable private fortunes. Take for example, the cattle kings of California, Miller and Lux, the subject of David Igler's aptly named monograph, Industrial Cowboys. The large landholding patterns of the Mexican ranchos enabled these entrepreneurs to amass large land holdings. And the securing of irrigation rights gave them arable land and resultant capital to scare, scale up their empire. The aridity of the West that was such a disadvantage to small homesteaders served to advantage and encourage industry at scale. If you secured water, as Miller and Lux did, you were able to knock out all your competitors. Igler fur further demonstrates how Miller and Lux built a sophisticated, vertically integrated operation by exploiting both Western land and labor. And at their peak, they controlled 1.4 million acres and 1 million head of cattle. Success at scale, zero to one, as they say in modern day Silicon Valley. A similar pattern of subsidy, of course, as well as business favoring regulatory environment and very large scale enterprise occurred with the transcontinentals. An exercise in extreme wealth creation bracingly explored by Richard White in Railroaded, a book written about two flights upstairs. The transcontinentals were entwined with the state, he writes. Governments subsidized them, secured their rights of way, regulated them, protected them. The railroads in turn were agents of the expansion of these states. Together they formed a lever that in less than a generation turned Western North America on its axis so that what had largely moved north-south now moved east-west. White also dispenses with the pleasant fiction that Stanford, Huntington, Crocker, Hopkins, and other railroaders, or that any of the Western capitalists for that matter, were especially entrepreneurial geniuses whose success resulted from individual gumption, pulling themselves up in their bootstraps, um, or particularly keen intellect. They were lucky men, born in the right place, right time, living in a well-networked, uh, well-networked and willing to work the levers of power to their advantage. That kind of billionaire has never really gone out of style. The ethnic diversity and rapid fire growth of the West, of course, too, another regional hallmark, feeds into another aspect of, of Western mega wealth creation, which is a superabundance of cheap labor, exploitable labor, often non-white labor, whether native fur trappers in the Pacific Northwest or Mexican farm labor laborers in Central California or Chinese railroad workers on the Central Pacific. The frontier mythos, another enduring hallmark of the West, ones continued to be deployed by cowboy hat wearing billionaires or manifesto writing venture capitalists, is also something that is, when we look at it in the context of the lived experience of Western billionaires, doesn't really always play out, that actually something else is a hallmark that continues through over time that is more important, which is the connections that these individuals have to other wealthy people. Take, for example, the Copper King of Montana. There are lots of kings in the night. I love this stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, the Copper King of Montana, Marcus Daly of the Anaconda Mine, uh, who arrives in New York as, as a penniless Irish immigrant, comes up from nothing to great success to become a very wealthy man by the end of his life at the end of the 19th century. But if you look at, into his biography, you see the steps along the way that enabled him to build his great fortune, the fortuitous connections to already wealthy people, including George Hurst here in the Bay Area, including other mine owners in Montana, being able to get loans and buy-in at critical periods to work his way up. Yes, indeed, he had gumption and relentlessness and particular skills, but also he had help. We can hold these two things, these two ideas at the same time. You don't have to be one nor the other. So coming into the 20th century, some of these same patterns uh, continue, but in different ways. You have a much larger federal presence of the West in different ways. You have great fortunes made by people like Henry J. Kaiser, 
through building the dams of the irrigated West in the 1930s and 40s, including the Grand, Grand Coulee. I had to include this photograph of sheep being herded across the top of the dam, which I think is a perfect Western image. Uh, thank you. I think this. I think this is from UW Archives. About to credit it, but I think it's. I think it's from my hometown. Uh, and also, and then continuing Kaiser as well with the uh, defense mobilization of the Second World War, federal contracts being serving a national purpose, but also building um, great business empires. And this too continues into the post-war period with the Cold War military industrial complex and the spending that flows into this university and other universities and to this region in particular for electronics. And that works in concert with these bootstrap startups, garage startups like Hewlett and Packard founded in 1939 across town um, at the behest of their mentor, their graduate mentor, Fred Terman, who's there tracing away from the camera, um, shaking his now very successful former graduate student's hands. So we see these patterns, these networks, the federal presence, the vastness of the West, the markets of the West, the labor markets of the West, continuing on, continuing on into the founding stories of Silicon Valley itself, to the original venture-backed startup Fairchild Semiconductor, the mythos of the, of the traitorous eight. I'm sitting here in a room with the, the, the ultimate expert on the traitorous eight sitting here, so I'm gonna be very careful in, in assuming authority. Read Leslie's books, <laughs> Leslie Berlin's books to really understand. But one piece of the Fairchild Semiconductor story that often gets submerged in the larger narrative of triumphant venture-backed entrepreneur, scrappy startup, that spins off so many other startups is that the main book of business for Fairchild's first several years in operation came from the federal government. That its main customer for its very sophisticated integrated circuits, for which there was no commercial market in the early 1960s, was the space program, was NASA. That there was a foundational role that the federal spending played in launching the rocket ship of entrepreneurial capitalism in the Valley. Okay, so, how are today's Western tech billionaires like or different from their predecessors? Well, let's once again go back to how the Bill Lane Center reminds us to think about the West, because it's also useful. These salient characteristics, how are they continuing on into the more recent era, into the 21st, the late 20th and early 21st uh, century? Well, vastness, aridity, federal presence, rapid growth of markets, uh, ethnic diversity, populism and direct democracy, and the frontier mythos alive and well. Federal spending on military, military spending continues to be foundational in this part of the world and in Seattle, another hub of modern tech and, and another home of tech billionaires, as well as the rest of the West, not just during the Second World War and the Cold War and the foundation and the space program and the space race, but also continuing into the more modern era. Moffett Field, the same structure that housed um, airplanes during the Second World War is now on Google's campus and just adjacent to Mo Moffett Field is the this, the, off, the building that houses Google Cloud and Google's AI operations. Um, very sort of wonderful symmetry where not only is AI being developed as the next generation technology commercially, but also is um, serving, in Google's case, rather controversially as um, something that is a means for um, federal contracts coming from the Defense Department and others. Google. Uh, got in trouble for entering into defense work with the Pentagon, got in trouble with its employees about five years ago, but it, there still are, there still is federal business being done, and, and there also is in the other, with the other big tech companies. One hallmark of this Western wealth creation machine now continues to be federal spending, and particularly defense and national security spending. That hasn't gone away, it's just taken different forms. Connected to this, but that identical to it is this continuing um, political sponsorship and championing of, of Western tech and, West, and the billionaire wealth that comes from that. Uh, if we have Thomas Jefferson writing approvingly to John Jacob Astor in 1808 saying, go for it, go to the Pacific Northwest, so excited, happy to, have, happy to see you do it. 
Then we have, you know, fast forward to Bill Clinton and Al Gore coming to a uh, East Bay school and wiring it for the internet in a celebration of Net Day. Remember in 1996 when connecting schools to the internet was gonna solve all of our educational problems? <laughs> that was a thing. Um, I was there. <laughs> we, everyone was very excited about it. Um, and this continues into you know, what now seems very, very long ago. In 20, this is when Barack Obama came to Facebook in April of 2011 for a town hall meeting. If you remember this from the mists of memory from 12, 12 young, long years ago in Silicon Valley time, the biggest buzz beforehand, kind of like Jeff Bezos and his cowboy boots, was what everyone was going to wear. So was Barack going to wear a hoodie? Was Mark going to wear a suit? And what they did was kind of a theatrical, came in wearing jackets, took it off, rolled up their sleeves. You know, Now they look like Hewlett and Packard circa 1955. It's kind of cute. <laughs> Um, but this was not so long ago, but yet a very different moment during the relationship between Washington, D.C. and Silicon Valley. A lot of water has gone under the bridge since then, but those connections are still very, very important and very formative, whether they be collegial or adversarial. It's this government and tech relationship continues to condition what wealth is being made. And the investments, the government investments, the public investments of prior eras are conditioning what's happening right now and what is happening in the future. The dams built along the Columbia and other great rivers of the West in the 1930s and 40s and 50s that were there to provide abundant energy for the hope, hopeful industrialization of the Pacific Northwest. But when the, there was not adequate demand for that electricity, big publicly sponsored tie lines started from places like the Dalles all the way down to LA to power metropolitan Southern California, to power the Bay Area. And that super abundant energy has been the reason that the major tech companies are locating large data centers along these same places in the Columbia. Um, it also being lured by a really nice enterprise zone program that Oregon has that gives nice tax breaks to these companies for 10, 15 years if they move um, big, big facilities into, into Oregon. So we have a new geography of the West that's being built on top of the old. You have Google's data center at the Dalles, which I visited along with sophomore college last, last month. Um, that is, uh, they're building a new facility that is act literally on the footprint of the former aluminum smelting plant that was built with, a, with defense dollars as, as it, in the 1950s as a way to both build up the national supply of aluminum, the stockpile of aluminum, and also to hopefully industrialize that part of the interior West. The past and the present are interconnected. This is not something we're not, and this is of course, these data centers and facilities are all the more important as AI speeds up because what does artificial intelligence need? More and more and more and more energy. It requires, you, many, many thousands of households of worth of energy are required for one, you know, one day of chat GPT searches. It's really extraordinary. And the other thing that data centers need is water. They need water to cool these facilities. So much so that last year, Google's data center in the Dalles used 29% of the entire municipal water supply. The city sued and they've, they've come to an agreement <laughs> to, to do, something, do something to pay them back. The networks that advantage the big four, Marcus Daly and so many other 19th century and 20th century capitalists are also very, very much a secret of Western wealth creation and perpetuation now. This is, um, uh, if you, I think you can still do a Google search and find this, um, anim the animated version of this shot on the New York Times website. This is a visualization that I did with the New York Times opinion sections visualization team that looks at the family tree of money. It follows the money um, from the latest round. This was around the time that Lyft went public a few years ago, tracing back to who, who funded who, funded who, funded who, all the way back to Shockley Semiconductor, Georges Dorio at Harvard Business School, and William Shockley himself. These connections, these connections of mentorship and money, 
are absolutely foundational and formative to the story of the explaining why Silicon Valley, the flywheel keeps on going and one generation of companies uh, continues at the next. If, I, if we were to update this, this is March 2019, you could add a whole bunch of other new AI-focused startups that are once again clustering, in, particularly in San Francisco, but also here, that the next generation of tech is growing in the same places that the existing generation already was. Okay, so here are some similarities, networks, federal presence. Okay, all right, history repeating itself, Gilded Age again, yeehaw. No, there's some differences. What's the difference? What's different here? Well, one is scale, scale of enterprise and scale of wealth. Henry Kaiser, rich guy, not a billionaire. Even with all my inflation adjusting math, no, not a billionaire. Hewlett and Packard, billionaires, but not mega billionaires, like mini billionaires, <laughs> you know, small. Trust me, being, you know, having $1 billion is plenty. So you can do a lot, as we know from the philanthropic, you know, uh, residue that Hewlett and Packard have left here. Today's Western billionaires are just so many orders of magnitude wealthier. Again, this is, this is clipped from just my, you know, two days ago, as according to Forbes. Larry Page uh, and Sergey Brin, former Stanford computer science graduate students, uh, are now respectively worth $114 billion and $110 billion courtesy of Google stock. So it's just another order of magnitude. So what does this mean? What does this mean for the West and what does it mean for beyond the West? Well, mega wealth is transforming Western landscapes, leaving its mark on Western landscapes. Enclaves of the super wealthy, whether it be you know, the Yellowstone Club and Big Sky, um, or just around here in the housing prices in Palo Alto and Menlo Park. It is a, there's a very tangible effect of such extraordinary concentration of wealth, not just mega, mega billionaires, but even just regular old billionaires or multimillionaires. There is a philanthropic imprint on the region and on the world. Now, this large scale philanthropy is, again, there are, other, there are many scholars, including many folks here who are doing really important work examining this new age of phil philanthropy, but it is similar to the philanthropy of the Gilded Age in that, yes, it is very large scale, yes, it is transformative, but also it is following the priorities of the billionaire that is funding it. Andrew Carnegie, libraries. Bill and Melinda Gates, public global health. They've, they've expanded into many other things, but in the initial, the, the first years of the Gates Foundation, I remember having a testy conversation with some, someone in the environmental field who for some reason thought since I lived in Seattle, I, I knew the Gateses, which I didn't, uh, but that saying they aren't doing anything on environment. Nothing, nothing, so important. Global warming, climate change. I'm like, yeah, I know, but that's what they've decided to put their eggs in that, you know, the global health path. And indeed, like that was a very significant move for them to focus on one or two things comprehensively, but again, the priorities of the extremely wealthy, just as in the 19th century and early 20th, are reflected, you know, they shape the, their philanthropic efforts. Um, who these billionaires are is also important. Um, this has been a very um, single gendered presentation, and it continues to be so. The tech industry has gotten quite a bit of heat for the gender imbalance in the tech industry, for, uh, for the lack of diversity on many different metrics. And also, let's even if you had a more gender diverse and a, even more, more underrepresented groups re represented in this shot of the last supper at Y Combinator, I think. <laughs> this is very interesting. This was a stage for Bloomberg um, about 10 years ago. In the center in the blue here is Paul Graham, who's the former head of Y Combinator. His successor was Sam Altman, who you might know in the news, as who's now running OpenAI. So a very, um, as anyone at Stanford knows, very, very important um, institution in the growing of the next gen Silicon Valley economy. But even if it were more racially diverse, gender diverse, beyond what it already is, it would still consist of people who probably, I'm guessing a bunch of people in this picture went to Stanford, 
and probably some went to UW maybe even, um, and MIT, and a few elite programs. They all live on the west coast of the United States in the sunshine. <laughs> um, they all, you know, like we all do, we all are of a, of a place and a time and our worldview reflects that. And this, the stakes of this have been clear, and the results of this are clear, where you have software programs and platforms that now have global reach, that go all over the world. This is no longer, the you thought the Transcontinental Railroad was big. Think about the reach of the big tech platforms, the American-based tech platforms that are based here, right here, here in Seattle, this very narrow band of the American West, made by a very demographically narrow group of people who may, for all their best intentions, want to incorporate a wide variety of views and anticipate what's coming around the corner. But as we have seen, it has been very difficult to see what the downstream effects of the technology might be. And those stakes are getting even higher now that these extraordinarily powerful generative AI models are now taking hold. This is another clip that I just pulled off. Thank you, Stanford. Um, thank you, Stanford, uh, for producing this um, Foundation Model Transparency Index. This is just what was released last week. Um, looking at examining these major large language models, these generative AI models that are under development, and seeing how transparent, meaning how open, how much outsiders outside the developers can see or be, see what's going into them and how they're being developed. And what this shows, it shows that the, the best, the, the top player here is Meta with its Llama 2. Um, and keep in mind, open, having open source development of large language models has its pitfalls too. One reason that these are closed and the argument that many of the developers make for keeping them closed is bad actors could start messing with them and influence them in dangerous ways. But it also is reflecting the fact that a same rather narrow band of people living in the American West <laughs> are having a, an enormous influence on what these these models are going to look like, what these technologies will look like in the future. This is not to praise or to bury. This is to observe and to think about. And these are all very live questions. One thing that is, one learns, uh, the longer you do history, the more you realize that making predictions is a very dangerous business, as well as having a take on something that's happening right now. Generally, we like to wait, I don't know, quarter century or more. To, it's very difficult to write and, and to draw conclusions about the immediate past. I'm foolhardy enough to do it on the regular <laughs> or to write about people who are still living and breathing and can talk back to me. Sorry, Mark Andreessen. Uh, but it is, you know, it's worth asking, having historians ask these questions. It's worth thinking about something that is often disembodied, like AI or the cloud. The cloud exists in space. It exists in Western space. It moves along the great infrastructure built during the New Deal in the Second World War. It, it exists in, it has a physical manifestation. If something catastrophic happened along the, the Columbia, all of our stuff uh, stored in the cloud might go poof because it exists in a place. It exists in a data center or data centers in the West. It's using resources, finite resources in the West. And the Western mythos, the ideas about the West, ideas that Western historians have worked to contextualize or debunk or to push back against or to complicate, those are still very live. Those are still enabling grand thinking about technological possibility but also something that might not be aware of the downstream effects of what might be built. But it runs very deep. So where I want to end is with the same person that I began with, but in an earlier part in his life, but also in West Texas. Jeff Bezos in his cowboy hat. I'm guessing he was about six. And he's on his grandfather's ranch where he spent every summer growing up, where his grandfather and he would go out and rope cattle and uh, check the barbed wire and be the cattle kings of West Texas, I suppose, and where he talked 
lovingly about his grandfather and how his grandfather taught him so much about being self-sufficient, about making something, making do with what you've got. Um, and I would imagine, although Bezos doesn't talk that much about this, I would have to imagine that there had to be some conversation or awareness of what his grandfather had done before his grandfather retired to his ranch in West Texas, which his grandfather, Preston Guise, was among other things, the original deputy director of DARPA in 1957, 58, and also ran the entire Western region of the Atomic Energy Commission, including Los Alamos and others. He was a civil servant. He was part of this longer history. So when Bezos, a few years ago, when there was a dust up about Google doing defense contracts, and Jeff Bezos at the time, still CEO of Amazon, said, I think we should work with the Defense Department. This is important. I thought about his grandfather. And I thought about that history and that Western history that's imprinted on these Western billionaires and how that shapes their thinking and what they're doing now and what they may do next. And I will leave it there. Thank you, Margaret. And uh, Margaret has graciously agreed to take some questions and maybe even some comments, but questions are probably going to be more welcome than comments. <laughs> and for those of you who are participating by <coughs> Zoom, if you will use the Q&A function on your screen, uh, not the uh, chat function, that would be very helpful. So we do have one from Zoom yeah. to get us started. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure what it's meant by this, but I'll, I'll throw it out to you and you can, uh, so um, what about the power of New York? What about the power of New York? I don't know if that's like energy power or well, other kind of power. I but. think, well, no, I think that, you know, Western capitalists were not the only capitalists, of course. And, I, and, and I, this, I mean, this does reach back to another dimension that's, you know, very much at play in, in the American West then and now um, in different ways. Uh, you know, originally, kind of the original verdict on um, Western capitalism was very much inflected by um, you know, the plundered province thesis of these Eastern capitalists going and extracting the resources of the Great West and bringing it back, and that that there wasn't really homegrown industry here or, or technological or organizational innovation here, that it was coming, and that the financing was also coming from the East. And, and I think, again, looking at you know, the recent historiography, particularly historiography of the West, has really complicated that in very useful ways, and actually in doing so has made the industrial history of the United States much more robust. It isn't just about Lowell, Massachusetts and the textile mills. Um, or it isn't just about the Erie Canal. It's also about um, what is going on in the far west. It's about Miller and Lux. It's about the transcontinentals. It's about these business enterprises, the role of, the, of San Francisco as a, as a central hub and a hinterland that goes east from San Francisco rather than just west from Boston or New York. What's interesting now about the role of, when I think New York now in the more, the latter day context, in the more modern context, I think particularly about Wall Street and finance. And really where, you know, Silicon Valley, going back to that slide of, you know, the tech was only big, wasn't that big until just recently. Where it really goes into overdrive and where Silicon Valley becomes a wealth creation machine is in the 1990s with the dot com boom and the run up of stocks and the excitement around that. And Wall Street analysts, playing a big role in kind of explaining the internet to investors. Now, yes, there were millionaires being minted and billionaires minted before that, but they were much fewer in number. <laughs> and there were exciting IPOs, but they were smaller in number. And even, you know, but, and even, you know, when you look again, I spent a lot of time looking at numbers and doing, you know, $19.96 and $20.23. I do a lot of that, like, you know, what is this worth now? Um, even so, the 1990s were not, were relatively, the dot-com boom was relatively small to what we've seen in the 21st century, and particularly since the Great Recession. It's just, it's just astounding, the numbers. I mean, the Netscape IPO, which was the IP of the, in, the initial public offering that set off the dot-com boom in the mid-1990s, that was about the equivalent of about $3 billion. Now, <laughs> there have been companies you haven't even heard of that had $30 billion IPOs in the last several years. I mean, it's really, or three, you know, it just, it's, it's nuts. Um, so now an IPO is not actual <laughs> lasting value, as some people have discovered, but it, it does, it is a metric for how much money is kind of sloshing around the system and being invested and reinvested. And even now, in, you know, with all of the excitement hype around 
generative artificial intelligence and all the money that's being poured into it, it's a reflection of the fact that there are a lot of venture capitalists around here that have a lot of money to, that they need to deploy in some way. And crypto didn't work out like they hoped. So there's the next thing. I'm not saying AI is just like crypto. There's a lot more there there. There's actually more use case um, that can be seen. Uh, but nonetheless, there's a, you know, we're seeing different orders of magnitude and the role, this kind of interplay between not only Washington and Silicon Valley, but also Wall Street and Silicon Valley. And then the triangulation between the three of them is a really, really important thing to understand and understand this flywheel of wealth creation. Yes, the question for those on Zoom who might not have heard all of it had to do with the techno utopian manifesto, which I do encourage everyone to, to read. It's really interesting. And, um, and when I read it last week, I, I was almost tempted to kind of toss everything out and just do an hour on, on the techno optimist manifesto, but I, that's not really why you guys signed up for this. Yes, techno optimist. Um, and, it, and yes, I think it is, you know, look, uh, you know, why is, it, it is a pretty raw, um, you know, Mark Andreessen unfiltered. Um, I, you know, to what degree that is, you know, it's really good for, if you're in the business of investing in new technology and young technologists, it's probably really good to be position oneself as, I believe in the future, I believe in unfettered technology, I am, you know, don't be, don't listen to the haters, don't listen to the naysayers, those trust and safety people. Like he actually calls out trust and safety, like, you know, controls as a problematic in keeping technological progress from progressing, which, um, so it's very much keyed to kind of a, a response to the, um, what he refers to as quote, a victim mentality. Um, and is very kind of, it is, again, for a historian of the West and a historian of Silicon Valley, to read that, it's quite something. Um, it's it's coming, and you know this is a very uh, a very influential figure in the valley, and and I think I think reflects a, th a thinking that is you know this is one reason my kind of curiosity about about extremely wealthy people also comes one because I've studied having s studied some of them or studied you know these these successful people for so long they're you know they're neither heroes nor villains, they're very complicated, just like we all are, right? That's, the other, that's why I like to write about politics and presidents. They're all very complicated. Um, but what really does happen with extreme wealth is that a bubble is created. Um, and it is very, very hard to, to hear from outside the bubble, just as you know, we talk about the, the bubble of the West Wing, how a president has a hard time really understanding what's going on unless they have good people working for them to say, you're wrong about that, this is what's going on, you need to wake up and smell the coffee. And I think you know, part of what I read into that manifesto is a, a real kind of unwillingness to um, so taking the critics and saying, you know, you're just naysayers, you think, you know, this is, you're, you're standing in the way of pro progress, it's time to do something different, and, and feeling like it has the social capital and the capital to do that. So there's a lot there there. I could, yeah, we could have a whole workshop on, on that. It's really interesting, it's really interesting, yes. Um, okay, I'm gonna go, Gavin, Isaac, all right. First is, are you counting Texas as part of the rest? Ah. It's on your list, you have your own muscle. Yes. Uh, Jeff Bezos. Uh, but in terms of political culture, it would seem Texas and California is very, were very different. Opposites. And you also made the remark that the new tech uh, generation is happening in the same places as the old. Well, Austin, Texas thinks <coughs> that it's a whole new tech center. I'm not asking you to predict that. Yes. But it does seem that the cultural, well, the role of energy, yeah. uh, yeah. the priorities it would seem to be very different. Yeah. So how does Texas versus California fit into your uh, your framework. Ah, that's a great question. Well, this is the this is the eternal question of like the many Wests in the West, right? But um, but but also, I think um, my my uh, the, the late H. Ross Perot would differ say, in, in the, the the assessing Texas as a latecomer to the high tech game, um, and Austin and Dallas have have been in the tech business, you know, arguably making microchips as long as they've been making them here. Um, but your fair point, and I did spend some time with John Wesley Powell's map determining <laughs> where the 100th meridian ran <laughs> and I, when I was doing this presentation. Um, West Texas, west of the 100th, in the, in the arid zone, um, and Austin not. 
Uh, and, you know, I'm giving, I'm, I'm calling Elon a Californian because he's in Texas to escape the taxes, allegedly. Um, and, um, and Bezos is a Seattleite slash LA resident. Um, uh, but you know, maybe some, they all have so many homes now, it's hard to say. Um, but I think he's, I think, yeah, Bezos is still a Washington State resident because we don't have income tax. So that's, that's one reason Amazon's there, actually. Um, that was part of the, calc that was part of the, the, what he calls his regret minimization framework, his whole spreadsheet he did to where, where should I start my company? company. Lower taxes. Yeah. yeah. Isaac, question from Montana about the Yellowstone Club and real estate. That's, that's coming from the heart. Um, <laughs> which is, and that is another, well, you know, the history of America is the history of real estate, right? Where Astor made more money in real estate than he did in fur, made a lot of money in fur. Um, but that, you know, that is where you, if you're making a lot of money, where do you put it and where do you make money on it? And uh, yeah, Bill Gates is one of the biggest agricultural landowners in the United States. There are very significant, not all tech billionaires, but, but there have been Im immense tracts of land, whether it be um, in production or simply, you know, conservation trusts that are now in the hand, in private hands. I, I, that's a, it's a really good and provocative question to which I have so much curiosity and I feel I don't have all the answers, but there, you know, this is a control, this is part of a broader narrative of things that were once public moving into the private. Now, of course, this is all land that was once native land. And this is all land that the public for a very long time, that, you know, the federal government divvied up the land that it seized and gave it to the railroads and gave it to, you know, the, the capitalists. So this transfer of public to private and the seizure of land and, and the, the occupation of land that, um, that this is not a new thing, but there is, you know, this is something, the consequence, and particularly the last 15 years, it really is stunning. That, and, and this is, I think, again, where historical thinking actually really illuminates the present because it was only when I wrote the code and was starting Silicon Valley, you know, Started in the 40s, and then after my editor was like, you can't end with a dot-com bust. You have to go to the present. I went to the present. And just writing about the 21st century, as uncomfortable as it was for me at first, made me fully understand for the first time how the enormity of this is like Silicon Valley on steroids since, you know, such a different place than it was the day I walked into History Corner as a postdoc in 2002. And then it was go-go. Well, it was kind of go, going down. But anyway, we'd had a good decade or good few years. And so there's a real order of magnitude issue that, so when we do these longer, when we look over a longer period, then you start to understand, like, where's the novelty? Where is this a perpetuation of existing patterns, inequalities? Um, where are things moving backward? Where are they going forward? And then how do we properly do, do comparison and, and, and better understand like what is driving this? Because it's very hard to kind of start with. And in 2009, this is when everything started without going back, 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 back. That's why historians kind of tend to drive people crazy. Like I'll go and give a talk and people think I'm talking about contemporary Silicon Valley. I'm like, and in 1923, and they're like, oh God, I came for something else. Um, you know, don't talk about the old stuff. One of my friends who works at one of the big companies told me the other day, I was like, sorry. He's like, I was like, what do you consider old? He's like, anything before 1980. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> Damn. And he's an old guy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So how do we expect that so many of these people I'm talking about are not native Westerners, not born in the West? It's a very good question. And I think that, you know, that's a dimension of the West that probably could be added to the Bill Wayne Center's list, which is migration from elsewhere on the continent and elsewhere in the world, migration and immigration. And that certainly part of the, you know, the, the, the magic juju of early Silicon Valley, when we talk about the early tech community here, um, is the fact that it was a small community made up of people that, it, who, who, the people who were working in electronics in the 50s and 60s were by and large not from California. Of the traitorous eight, the only one, of the Fairchild Semiconductor founders, the only one from California was Gordon Moore. They were all from somewhere else. And so the process of moving and reinventing, for anyone who's moved across country or moved to another country, you know you had to rebuild a world. And that is something I think, you know, sometimes you're more passionate about your adopted <laughs> homeland. But Jeff Bezos grew up in Florida. I think his summers in Texas seemed to be more formative to him, or West Texas, um, but, and was a transplanted, you know, Seattleite, Elon Musk from South Africa by, by way of Canada. Yeah, the, sort of all of these, these arrival stories. Um, Bill Gates is from Seattle, but his parents, no, 
He's, he's multi-generational Seattleite, never mind. He's, he's, he's old school. But that's exception rather than the rule, for sure. It's a really good question. I think that's a, a defining regional characteristic, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, do the, do the odd habits and fixations and hobbies? Um, I think this is part of my curiosity about the, my theory of the, the tech bubble, the bubble of extreme wealth. And, and, and first of all, you need to have to spend your money on something. And sometimes it might be a silly something, and you don't have people around you to say, that's silly. Um, and you also have been told, I think there's also a very interesting phenomenon. Another thing I've been doing is kind of looking at the ages of all these various wealthy people from the you know, 1900s forward, uh, like when they first got really rich, how old were they? Um, because one of the things about the modern valley that's notable is that there's so many people who got really, really wealthy and successful at a very, very young age. And I don't know about you all, but if I had become a billionaire when I was 22, when Mark Zuckerberg was a, got to be a B, a billionaire, and I and and all the ideas I had in my head, and everyone around me is like, "You are right, you are so right." I would be a dangerous person because I had ideas when I was 22. I think all of us did that we might be like, eh, "Yeah, I don't know if I'd stick with that." So there's a really interesting kind of trapped in amber quality and a boyishness that's celebrated. So I think the other thing that's in play here, particularly in the modern tech industry, is this obsession with wealth that isn't really set out loud as much as it, or youth, sorry, as loud as it was like about 10 years ago when it was like, no one over 25 has a good idea, you know. Um, but now you see all these people who are my age, sort of Gen Xers, who are doing everything they possibly can to reverse the aging process and throwing all their money into it. And then also doing things that are really, you know, cage fighting, I think, is probably not something you do when you're in your early 50s. I, I'm, I'm not going to take it up. Just, just saying, um, but and I don't think that the Zuckerberg Musk cage fight is. If it was going to happen, it probably would have happened. But it was good. It was good fodder for a little while. Um, but there's a, there's this kind of fixation with youth, and also this, you know, again, again, living in a. We're seeing there's a public, you know, these these people are public figures in a way that. The 19th century, the super wealthy of the 19th century certainly had a public profile, and there was fascination, but they were very private. Um, I was, uh, Roland and I were just talking earlier about how Leland Stanford burned all his letters after his death. Like, there was a real desire to keep things private and to not let people know your business. And it's a real, for not everyone in this super wealthy class, but for a remarkable number of them, there is this kind of out front, they have a soapbox now and this public facing personality that's really interesting and weighing in on politics and things that, that the tech moguls of a generation ago did not do. You didn't know how Bill Gates voted. You just didn't know. Um, there was, you know, they were kind of this occupying this very neutral, seemingly neutral zone, which is no, no longer the case. Yeah. So we actually have quite a few uh, Zoom questions. I'll start with two that have some thematic resonances with each other. One is, um, with any of the extremely wealthy gilded age individuals, were there any who attempted to rebalance the imbalance their wealth had created? And how do our current billionaires compare with the historic ones in driving and distorting public policy to favor wealth and increase inequality? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think there were, you know, it depends on when we look at the um, industrialists of old, there are moments of, um, you know, pricks of conscience, moments of, 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 you know, wanting to do better by their workers and then deciding that, no, you know, the path of our Andrew Carnegie and labor relations is a tortured one. Um, but they really um, did have a, you know, a gospel of wealth, a philosophy of wealth and philanthropy, of, of giving things away. Um, you know, John Rockefeller, famously pious, and parsimonious, as we say in the pageant, um, was, uh, you know, really did see him, you know, living a, himself living a godly life and, and that his, his riches were a result of that, um, a reflection of that godliness. The, you know, there's, I, I see the... I see the wealthy of old having the same dilemma that those of now have, which is sometimes doing the right thing goes against the business model. And it becomes hard to continue to 
keep that stock price and keep those quarterly earnings if you change something that's going to decrease ad revenue greatly, right? And and there are kind of analogs for that. Um, hey, it's capitalism, man. Um, that's that's often, and I think that's again where we saw we saw in the 19th century and see today the limitations of the what I call the why won't Jeff Bezos fill the potholes in Seattle argument, <laughs> which we hear a lot. Why all this money? Why aren't they doing this, that, the other? Why isn't Amazon doing this? Why isn't Microsoft doing this? Mm. They're for-profit companies that are publicly traded on the stock exchange. They have a board of directors. They have a C-suite that is accountable to keep, you know, they have quarterly earnings. They have things. They have a their job is to do not to fill the potholes and not to do things that are going to undermine that profit. The job of the government is to create guardrails and regulations that are going to create the better incentives or per not allow them to do things that are harmful. That, I mean, that's what it is. <laughs> and, um, and, and to sort of have this philanthropic fallback is not very, not very useful. Um, you know, I, I think it's challenging because there's, you know, again, when you, when you look at, uh, you know, history shows you the humanity of people in the past and the present and, you, and, and builds empathy. Maybe not understanding, maybe not sympathy, maybe not I'm on your side, but you cut empathy for them. And these are complicated human beings who you see making choices and being um, constrained by circumstances and also making some really bad choices and having immense power and not using it responsibly. So are the one are the the folks today worse than the ones that I you know, I think there's it's very hard to make blanket statements about the different generations of wealth. I think one thing that is really I really, really impressed upon me by doing this comparative research is how much bigger it all is now, how many more billionaires there are, how much more money they have, what the, the scope and the scale of their influence has become, um, as immense as the fortunes were of the robber barons, um, it, it is another order of magnitude. But before I leave at end of this, this quest, answer to this question, I must note one incident of a Western billionaire really wanting to deploy his wealth for good, which is Leland Stanford starting this university, which was intended to be for the children of California, tuition-free, co-ed. Leland and Jane Stanford, you know, in their own way, were trying to make the world a better place. And, um, and we can dissect, you know, <laughs> what, what, was, what was good, bad, what, what was realized about that or not. But there's, you know, there is this, we are, you know, living, we are, and I think that's another reason that studying the wealthy of now, but why the wealth of now is so consequential, because 150 years from now, someone's gonna be sitting in an auditorium in someone's university, <laughs> or living, living in a world that these very wealthy people have shaped in some way, whether it be philanthropically or through their business enterprise, and that's significant. It's not gonna just go poof. Yes, there, and then I'll do another Zoom one. I'm going to ask a question maybe in a little bit of a hypothesis. To your list of things that are the same and different then versus now, I uh, ask you to consider labor as yes. fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. uh, these large labor-based uh, old fortunes, very different mm -hmm. from what we're seeing today, and partially because uh, maybe um, in a more regulated environment than Carnegie had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you actually have to deal with your labor. So yeah. In thinking about that, what's your perspective on, on, on labor as either something that's the same or different? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. I think it's, yes, the, so the labor of this kind of the labor, labor landscape of the, of the American West itself and the labor landscape of the companies is different. But there is, in the case of the technology companies, you know, what we have here, at least in you know, Silicon Valley itself or Seattle itself, is the tip of a giant submerged iceberg of labor that is mostly overseas labor. Um, you know, not only does AI have a materiality and a physical presence in the data centers and the networks that connect them and the undersea cables, but also it has a presence in the workers around the world who are doing digital piecework, who are doing these identifying, you know, cancerous moles on a scan and helping train the machines. Um, you have a lot, a, a vast, vast body of, you know, of thousands and thousands of very low wage labor, kind of comparable to the many thousands who were working to build the transcontinentals. I mean, the, and, the, and that hidden nature, submerged nature of 
the labor and also the ecological impacts of a lot of this technological production of all of our wonderful machines, which we love so much, but they are, you know, we aren't feeling the, economic, the environmental impact of these at the Stanford Research Park anymore, that the Superfund sites have been cleaned up by and large, but over in Shenzhen, there's a different, different calculation. So, that, you know, that's another way to think about, you know, of course, the American West story has always been a global one. It's always been a transnational one. It's always been one of trans-Pacific connections. But particularly in the case of the tech industry, it has this global reach and the undifferentiated reach of these tech project products. Whereas, you know, a Google search, a Google search engine or a Facebook page kind of travels around the world. Whereas, and it can't, it is not subject to state level, national um, level regulations in the way a car is. That's something that is different and distinctive. Again, historical comparison helps us appreciate those differences as well as those parallels. Thank you for that question. I'm glad you asked it. Yes. Okay. Do all the data centers along the Columbia River, et cetera, create a national or regional security risk? Who do not do all the data centers create a national security risk? Um, there is definitely security concerns because it is really, really hard to find out information about these centers as those of us who've attempted to have. I have a very diligent and often frustrated research assistant, thank you, Jess, um, who is trying to get hard information about when, where, how, what, and there is a lot of opacity. Now, that's partially corporate communications opacity, but also there's a national security. They are, um, they are located with care. They're located out of an earthquake out of earthquake zones. There was apparently um, New Zealand, there are a number of data centers being built um, for Microsoft and other companies in New Zealand at present. And I think there was uh, apparently one of the sites was alarmingly close to an earthquake zone. It's been moved. <laughs> um, but there's, you know, there has to be, there, this is where geology and ecology and, and again, this is, th this has a material presence. This is physical. It is not the cloud. Um, it is it is something that is very real and has a tangible effect. It should also be noted that the Oregon Enterprise Zone program is designed to bring jobs to rural Oregon, which is why we have these things, right? Um, and that while data centers employ hundreds of people in their construction, and they're often constantly expanding, so there's a lot of jobs there, the actual number of people it takes to run the data center is very, very, very few. So there's a lot of taxpayer money being spent or tax breaks being given for relatively few jobs, which often happens with these types of things. <laughs> Familiar story. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more to how you think about comparing dollar values over time. Mm -hmm. For one thing, given that like inflation is based on how many houses and yeah. jars of milk can you buy? Yeah. Like how many companies can you own or countries can you control? Yeah. Like, does the money translation power yeah, that's it. I'm glad you asked that. So there's like the raw sort of nominal conversions. And then there's also percentage of GDP, which is another, you know, that is when you look at percentage of GDP, for example, John Rockefeller at the peak of his wealth was, his wealth was equivalent to 2% of US GDP. Elon Musk's wealth at his peak, which was 2021, not now, was about a little under 1% of GDP. Still a lot, um, a lot of money. Um, I, you know, I think money, money's money. <laughs> there's, a, there's, you know, GDP, I think can take you to some, take you somewhere, but I, you know, when you think about what, yeah, what can be bought and what that reflect, what value that reflects, what value is being placed on the companies. And keep in mind, a lot of this net worth, this is driven by stock price. So this is all reflecting what the stock market is doing and the valuation of these companies. But then what it enables these people to do is to, it gives them the, resources to then do other things. So they can, you know, they, Elon Musk is not a very liquid guy, <laughs> but he's able to leverage a lot, you know, get a lot of capital, um, uh, whether, even, even if it's to, you know, you know ill-starred errands, it's, it's, there's a way to raise lots of money with that. So that I think it's, it's very imperfect. And I think um, I'm not doing, you know, kind of cross temporal comparisons for a reason. I think it's not those sort of top 10 lists of wealthiest Americans of all time kind of doesn't have the utility. I think it's better to look at a snapshot and to think more about what does that wealth enable you to do and what sort of power does that reflect? What, so what, power, what political power does it reflect? What cultural power, what cultural cachet, what market power, what, what ability to sway labor markets, what sort of um, you know, what did they get for free or for, for a discount? <laughs> you know, what subsidies are reflected in that? That's, I think, the more interesting question and actually is more, you can do more with that rather than say, oh, look at all the money they have. Like, hmm, 
you know, that's the market is the market, and it's going to investors are going to drive things up. Yeah. Okay. Two questions from Zoom. So this one's kind of a tongue twister. <laughs> this research is rich with rich white men. Where are the rich women? <laughs> There's a second question about diversity. Um, and then uh, the second question I have is a little long, so I'll let you answer that one first. Okay. Where are the rich white women? They're often divorced or widowed by the rich white men. That's my, I, I, yes. Um, um, this is, I mean, this is a story about gender. This is a story about inequality. This is, I mean, I, I have a very, very homogenous array of people, and that's telling a story about power in America. It's telling a story about capitalism in America. It's telling a story about what has not changed. Um, you know, women can be billionaires too. I mean, there are, there are, really, but, but what it is reflecting, I think, too, is something that is quite specific. Well, it's, Amer it's a story of American business where there still is uh, you know, the women at the women in the C-suite are a far, far smaller percentage of than they are um, in their in the population, and also in venture capital and in this decision, you know, decision making. But the, you know, one thing this also is re is reflecting is this intergenerational nature of wealth creation, and we see this very vividly in Silicon Valley, where the venture model is often like. I see you, I think you look like someone who's gonna make money for me, because you look like the person. The person who made money for me last time was wearing the same hoodie, and, or went to the same program, or had the same mentor, or part of the same network, right? It is sometimes the same hoodie, but it really is these tacit, and, and look, there's a reason for this. This is the, the personal relationships are part of the magic of the wealth creation machine in Silicon Valley as it was in the Gilded Age. Um, what, was, what has been amazing and kind of making my head explode when I really dig into you know, the business associations of people like Carnegie and Gould, and they all knew every, everyone was in business with everyone else. It was just this crazy web of connection, just as the modern technology industry is too. And that perpetuates homogeneity as well, and, and by by remarking on that, noting that, observing that, we also understand why that is such a hard thing to unwind. The multi-generational, not impossible to unwind, we also recognize that it's constructed. This is not something that is just inherent in terms of ability or who's, it's who had opportunity to do those things. Okay. Back in the 1980s, there was an attempt to kickstart the tech industry around Boston and around Harvard and MIT. Why did those companies fail to dominate the emerging technology field the way the Microsofts, Netscapes, Apples did? What didn't Massachusetts and New England possess that the West did? And will MIT's success in being a hub for new biotech companies be the exception that proves your rule about the West preeminence? The West preeminence. Ah, uh, Boston. So I think George Dorio is crying a little tear from the grave. So Boston, in the beginning, Boston was the big deal, and Silicon Valley was the scrappy little outsider, like the little chicken hawk trying to get in. And the, the in the early decades, the 1950s and 1960s, the early post-war decades, part of Silicon Valley's regional advantage was its close connections to people and firms and money in Boston. All the venture capital was on the East Coast. All the, the money people, the, the computer industry was East Coast based. There was not, this was miniature electronics, this was esoteric military electronics and communication devices. This was not commercial products. The mainframes were being built in White Plains, New York. The, the, this, was, this here in the 50s and 60s was a, not the main commercial part of the technology industry. What happens over time, and I think the question about the 80s and 90s is really, really important because this is the moment when both Silicon Valley and Boston go from being places that are mostly about hardware, building computer hardware, and turning to software into the internet. And there are a number of other things that kind of play in. I think that, that the, you know, both, were, both Boston and, and here were defense-dependent economies. The end of the Cold War was something that was a shock to the system here, but one where the commercial internet kind of came up and in and filled, kind of buoyed the economy um, in relatively short order, although those who remember the post-Cold War recession in California would probably say it wasn't very short. 
But Boston did not have that same kind of bounce back. And part of that had to do was the main thing driving the Boston tech economy by the 1980s was um, mini computers, which were not, for those of you who don't know, they were not mini. They were large. They were kind of the step between mainframes and personal computers. They were um, large um, commercial academic um, scientific computing that was manufactured by, notably by digital DEC. Um, and th that was an extraordinarily lucrative industry. And personal computing and desktops and workstations kind of took, took the bite out of that and they didn't really have a second act. So there are a lot of local conditions. I would also argue that there's, you know, Boston had, the one thing that this place had going for it, it's a company town. No, you, all you're doing is, it was tech. In Boston, there was, you know, more things happening. History, 300 years of history. Uh, and and th there was a more variegated economy and other and some other broader regional economic headwinds as well going against it. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about your method of working with the immediate past, especially when you're um, doing a comparative method with, um, with an archive that may be more rich. The archive of the immediate past is um, is a is a real it's a real challenge. I mean, first of all, the the medium itself media itself is is a challenge. Um, we've all been emailing for thirty years now, and that is not good for archives. Um, I think it also is challenging with the tech industry itself, which is very future future focused and not like let's keep these things in bankers boxes in my garage. Are valuable to keep. Um, I think we. I think this institution is is helping with this, and the Silicon Valley Archives now has, you know, resources to really build up its capacity and to make Stanford really the preeminent study for the history of this region as well as this industry, um, and other um, and other really important ventures like the Steve Jobs Archives that Leslie runs. Um, that we're getting more of these. You know, more of these papers are kind of. Coming, you know, put, being put together in archives rather than um, historians like me, kind of scrapping around and, and finding people's file folders, you know, talking to people, and, th and they're like, "Oh, I got this thing in the back," and and then you find something that's golden. It's really challenging. I rely a lot on journalism. I rely on a lot, the first draft of history. I, li I rely a lot. There's been a lot of really, really good tech journalism in the last 30 years, and I do lean a lot on that, and I lean a lot on those reporters and. Um, the beat reporting, and because you have to, um, I rely on um, oral histories to a point, and I rely on interviews. Um, interviews with people who, the less famous someone is, the better the interview. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the people who haven't been asked what they think, but have been in the room where it happens, are the most valuable. It's um, it is a work in progress, and it cannot. They are not analogs. Um, at the same time, they're great. Silences in the older archives, for example, the burning of the letters of people like Leland, Leland Stanford was not alone in disposing of his paper, of having his papers disposed of after his death. So we are always know our archives are partial, um, but one has to be very resourceful. And some of the greatest sources and gems I found, actually, the the network, the entirely networked nature of Silicon Valley has was a great advantage in writing the code because I would talk to someone, they say, oh, you should talk to my friend so-and-so, you should talk to my brother, you should talk to the, and I would just get in the network, and then I would end up having club sandwiches at the V for three hours talking to a bunch of venture capitalists who, who were well retired and had time. And it was great, I got so much information that way. So that's, that's the people, but the really famous people, they weren't, they didn't like to talk very much. <laughs> but I wanna say, Margaret, first of all, that uh, we're very sorry to you encountered even COVID last spring, but I think I speak for everyone here and online that you are well worth waiting for, so. Thank you, thanks. Thank you all.